Based in Delhi, India, Dr. Satendra Singh is best described as a healer, a teacher, a disability rights crusader, and an advocate for disability employment in the medical and healthcare industries. Acquiring a physical disability in his legs due to polio when he was nine months old, Dr. Singh went on to become a medical doctor and a professor at the University College of Medical Sciences, Delhi. A firm believer in diversity and inclusion, he fought discrimination to bring policy reforms that unlocked over 1,500 faculty posts for doctors with disabilities. His tireless work also helped to raise the bar for web accessibility standards in hospitals under the government of Delhi. As a child, you contracted polyomyositis. Um, what are some of the challenges, difficulties, and or hardships you've had to overcome um, as a result? Yeah, so I contracted polyomyelitis when I was nine months of age. And during that time, I was in uh, uh, you know a village area, rural area in the state of Haryana. And in fact, uh, I would say that it came as a blessing for disguise in the sense that it forced my parents to relocate to uh, the capital of Delhi. And because of that, all of us, you know, my brothers, we got very good education. So that was you know a blessing in disguise in that particular way. So that we got very good education. Now all of us are very much settled. But during the course of that time, my parents did, uh, you know, everything possible to so that, you know, I get cured. Uh, but, you know, they tried all sort of, you know, alternative treatments, even non-conventional therapies. But uh, there was, you know, uh, uh, not much improvement. And so, but I don't have any, any, you know, I was just nine months of age. So I have no memory of that time. So, you know, I am just like that. You know, I am living with this uh, disability, uh, polyomyelitis, is my locomotive disability. Uh, but in school time, you know, I faced, uh, uh, yeah, barriers in the form of physical barriers. But apart from that, you know, my elder brother was in my same school. So I got a lot of help during my schooling. My peers were very, uh, good to me. So I did not face any sort of a discrimination, uh, during my school life. Uh, but after that, of course, you know, that, that is, there is that typical gaze, which is associated with people with disabilities. So that was frequent in, <clears throat> in, in, society so but you know as you also <clears throat> would be my, you know uh, agree with me that we are people with various disabilities gradually we tend to ignore such things and we develop a very thick skin towards these things so mm -hmm. that leads to our perseverance so you know uh, there was there were various episodes like that individually uh, but gradually i did very well in my schooling and you know i followed the footsteps of my brother who is also a doctor he's a vascular surgeon and he inspired me to go into the medicine and that's how it all started. And now I'm a doctor. It's amazing. Uh, so yeah, my next question was going to be, uh, how did you decide to get into medicine? So it was from your um, brother. Yep. Okay. And so you and your brother um, are both doctors. Are there any other family members that yeah, are doctors? Are uh, no, we are four uh, you know, brothers. So the elder one is in a private job. Uh, the second one is vascular surgeon. Third one is in uh, Indian defense. He's in army. Oh, and wow. Army. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Very, very nice. Uh, so through, since you've been a child up until now, who do you think has impacted you the most in terms of um, your career as well as, um, you know, making a positive um, uh, uh yeah, making, I guess, a, a positive spin, as you want to say it, um, also with your um, challenges and, you know, being, you know, a big advocate for you. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question, Alexandra, because when I'm reflecting about this thing, that what is the most important factor which has changed the course of my life, I would say rather than one particular person, I would say it is the various discrimination meted out towards me by the society. Because of those constant discrimination, you know, it motivated me to challenge that status quo, that this is not correct and injustice is being happening. So we need to change that. And that was the biggest motivation because I remember when I was in medical school, uh, I was very content with my life and I believed that, you know, uh, 
that my disability is part of the problem because of the inaccessible places and my medical school was also not accessible. Uh, and to add to that, you know, our, uh, uh, the curriculum, the typical curriculum in medical schools, it is heavily based on the medical model of disability. So we are being taught that, you know, when you see a disability, you need to fix that because that is, you know, that is, that is not good. You need to correct that. So that was the training which you usually underwent through that model. And later on, I realized that there is another uh, social model of disability, you know, which talks about, which says that, you know, people only have impairments, but it's the society which makes us disabled. And this model says that the barriers exist in the society. You know, if, if there are, you know, physical barriers, somebody with a locomotor impairment will become locomotor disabled. Same is true for if you there is no information to... Uh, there is a lack of information, there is no braille, you know, then those who are visually impaired, they will become visually disabled. If there are no sign language interpreters, uh, you know, deaf people will became, uh, become hearing disabled. And so that's why I think, and the biggest barrier are, I, I, I believe it is, uh, these are the attitudinal barriers, the mindsets which are prevailing in the society. We can take care of the, you know, physical barriers, barriers to ICT, but I think the really, most important thing is that we need to tackle the mindset of the society because very often they very often they uh, question the competence of people with disabilities so i grew up with that particular identity in the medical school but when i was discriminated in employment so during that time i realized that you know now this is the time when i need to raise voice against the injustice which is being done because nobody questioned my competence when I was in the medical school, I was becoming a doctor. Nobody questioned when I did specialization. Uh, but then in, when I came to Delhi for a faculty position, they said these posts are not suitable for people with disability. And that was the point, that was the you know, uh, tipping point when I decided that you know, I need to fight for this discrimination. And based on a lengthy battle, I think it took four and a half years uh, with the Ministry of Health in India, uh, my petition, which ultimately led to opening of around 1,700 posts for medical doctors with disabilities. It's absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, you're definitely paving the way. Uh, it, it's wonderful. So, you know, you talk about discrimination and um, against disabilities and so forth, um, you know, obviously where you are in India. Um, but what do you think, I guess, um, I guess, I guess through the years, um, about the discrimination that has happened, um, you know, in the U.S. That's where I am. So we'll just say the U.S. Um, you know, we clearly have the Americans with Disability Acts, uh, Americans with Disability Act, um, the 504 Rehabilitation Act. Uh, but have you seen, um, or what is your view, of being Indian, um, on the uh, on Americans and um, them? Um, reducing the stigma um, around disability and um, increasing accessibility. Uh, yeah, but yes, you, you are very correct that, you know, in US we have this ADA, which, which is a very revolutionary act. Uh, but then again, if you look at, you know, the implementation part is the most important thing. Even with the advent of Americans with Disabilities Act, we still see that, you know, there are barriers in medical schools. The technical standards in various medical schools, they are discriminatory. They, they uh, prohibit certain type of disability, medical students having certain type of disability. So that is, that is, there is one particular aspect which is, um, which, is, which is there. And to add to that, we, if we, we see the example of the recent pandemic and, uh, you know, during the lockdown period, we saw that certain type of disabilities in the U.S., in four specific states within the U.S., the state of Tennessee, uh, California, and two more, you know, there was this complaint filed with the OCR that, uh, you know, people with certain disabilities like uh, traumatic brain injuries and neuromuscular disorders, cystic fibrosis, they were being discriminated because of the use of ventilators. So even in a, in a pandemic situation, I mean, this is the same thing. And that led to the movement in California, the hashtag in nobody is disposable, which is very true. And this is the same thing in global south. Even in our place also, you know, many a times during crash, you know, many a time we base those decisions, who will get the ventilator based on the quote unquote quality of life. 
which is a very subjective phenomena in the sense that, you know, who would judge what is my quality of life? And now I'm a person with disability, so many people can view me as a patient with disability. But on the contrary, I'm also a healthcare provider. I'm a provider with disability. So my quality of life is not that bad as, you know, you see in the typical academic papers that people with disabilities have a poor quality of life. So I think uh, these are the sort of mindsets and stereotypes which are have happening with uh, not only people with disabilities, but, you know, other marginalized communities as well. And it is the same whether it is happening in the U.S. or it is happening in the India or in the global south. We need to raise our voice against these injustices because, as uh, you know, as that very famous quote is, you know, that injustice anywhere is threat to justice everywhere by Martin Luther King, which is so apt. Martin Luther King, we know him well, of course. Uh, so what have you found to be uh, the biggest misconceptions of um, of uh, disability um, in, uh, you know, as a doctor? What have you seen? I think the uh, biggest misconception is uh, they very often see our disability first rather than our ability. So they tend to, you know, see the, the various impairments or the differences which we are having. And many times they make their judgment based on those imperfections. But having those, you know, uh, differences or maybe imperfections, that doesn't mean that we lack in our abilities. And I think that is the most important thing which people, society should know that we do have disability, but disability does not mean inability. So that is the mindset we need to change. And that is what we are seeing in the medical profession as well. If I give you the example of India, for a very long time, only people with lower limb mobility disabilities were allowed to become doctors. In 2018, they allowed certain other disabilities like those with visual impairment and dyslexia. And still there are other type of disabilities which are not allowed to pursue a career in medicine. So I have filed a, a suit, a lawsuit against uh, these discriminatory guidelines in India uh, so that, you know, I believe that we need to do ability assessment and not disability assessment. And when you provide reasonable accommodations to all people with disabilities, they can do wonders. I mean, there is no field in any profession where people with disability cannot excel. So where is the disability? It lies in the environment and you can nullify that when you are providing the reasonable accommodations. It is as simple as that. So these are the mindsets which we uh, we are dealing with and which we uh, need to tackle and shut up. I would agree. And that's part of my work. And what you just said is stuff that I, I mean, I, well, I'm obviously working towards, but it's something that is um, across the world. And, you know, just to hear it from you in India that people look at um, a disability as their inability and not their ability. Um, it kind of just hones in on, you know, the underlying um, issue that we have around disability in our community. And you know the world. Uh, so when it, uh, so you're um, you've won a very prestigious award. Um, you're the first Indian to uh, win the Henry Viscardi Achievement Award, which is given to um, extraordinary leaders in the global disability community. Um, what was um, being given this award? Um, what did it mean to you? Yeah, that was a very special award. I got that in 2017 in your city, New York. And why it is special is that uh, the award carries the name of the prominent disability rights activist from US, Henry Viscardi Jr. Now, Henry Viscardi Jr., he was mentored by Eleanor Roosevelt, the lady behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And based on her advice, uh, Henry Viscardi, uh, started Ability Inc., a nonprofit uh, in 1950s. And there was a first movement where uh, people with disabilities, you know, they said he has written a book also, which is Give Us the Tools. So there was a uh, organization which was, you know, uh, feeding and requesting to society that give us the tools we are capable enough. And that opened the doors for employment for people with disabilities in US during that time. And that's why, and since it is linked with Eleanor Roosevelt, so very often I personally believe that disability is a human rights issue. And I got that award from the CEO of uh, Henry Viscardi Center, 
who is John D. Camp, who uh, was born with the congenital disability and he is using four prostheses and uh, he is doing wonders. And where, where have you seen a CEO with disabilities, right? So many a time we talk about, you know, equal opportunities, but have you ever seen, uh, you know, chief executive officers who are given, people with disability given that particular post? So it bears the name of two great people and that's why that award remains special to me. That's really, it's amazing. Um, and I applaud and congratulate you. I know it was a few years ago, but um, that's a great award. I know what it's like to have um, an award given to you, especially for, well, your work, but then also as somebody who has a disability or medical condition themselves, because I've gotten awards too. And it's it's a really great honor. Um, so congrats, even though I know it was two years ago, but um, that's, that's really, really special. So how in India has the support been um, from the medical community in terms of um, your needs, but then also in terms of, you know, needs of people in general who have medical conditions and disabilities or differences, I should say, too. <laughs> so I would say that we are in a stage of transition. Uh, historically, I am in, in India as well as in Asia. Uh, the typical doctor-patient relationship is largely uh, based on a paternalistic model, which means that, you know, it's usually the doctors who are treated like gods, right? <laughs> so is, you know, patients, they do not have a much say in the treatment part. Uh, there is very little shared decision-making. More often than not, it's the doctors who decide the course of outcome for patients and people with disability. But now gradually the things have been changing because I mean, India was one of the most uh, prominent country who uh, signed and ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disability. So based on that, now it is legally binding on India that we need to change all of our laws, policies in line with UNCRPD. And based on that in 2016, we come up with uh, a very promising rights-based disability legislation, which is known as the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act 2016. So it is a very progressive act because it, it views disability from a human rights perspective. Our previous act was largely based on a charity-based uh, approach. So now we are talking about, you know, disability rights that way. So I think this is a good, uh, uh, very, that, that there was a great uh, watershed movement in India as far as the disability uh, history is concerned. Uh, but also then uh, we very recently revised our medical curriculum for the very first time into a competency-based curriculum. But unfortunately, it was still based on the medical model of disability. So that time I was working with the University of Chicago on uh, disability competencies that what are the minimum things which a health professional student must know about disability. So we come up with this disability competencies in consultation with the doctors with the disability, disability rights activists and health professionals, educators. And then uh, I did this judicial advocacy with the, the government in India. And finally, uh, we were successful and disability rights were included in the new curriculum as a mandatory part in the foundation codes, which was a great achievement because uh, even in the US it is still optional, it is not mandatory. So that way now things are changing, but it would take some time to change the mindsets because you know we still see, uh, you know, uh, there is not much physician, a diverse physician workforce in the form of health professionals with disability because of the various barriers. So the more we see health professionals with disabilities in, in our medical setup, I think we would have a more diverse workforce and that will ultimately help the you know, patient provider relationship as well. So people are changing. I mean, it is, the change is slow, but definitely you know, uh, a beginning has been made. It's amazing. And I think, especially with this pandemic and just, you know, everything that's been going on, I think things, well, things are, they, they are changing, um, but hopefully even more so with the um, disability um, community. I mean, there's this whole thing now with, you know, people having disabilities and getting the vaccine and, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, you know, I think, there is now, I think people are now seeing a real importance of, you know, that the disability um, community needs to be um, included more and more. 
I would add to that, in fact, in this pandemic, you know, there are great learnings for all of us. For a very long time, people with disabilities were demanding, you know, reasonable accommodations like work from home. And many a times we were not granted those provisions. Now the whole world is, you know, following those provisions. Mm -hmm. In a way, we, the people with disabilities, are we are the, you know, very good problem solvers. For a very long time, we have been adjusting to the adverse environment and we know how to survive, be it a pandemic or, you know, otherwise uh, insensitive society. Right. Um, so what do you think? I know we're like, again, like we're all just talking about being, we're in a global pandemic. But what do you see that needs to um, change still in the next 10 you know, 20 years, there's clearly a lot of change, but I mean, what do you think is the most important change that needs to occur? I mean, we can talk about India for, I mean, clearly, because that's where you are. Um, but, you know, what do you see as something? I, that- I, I, I can begin with my wish list for the United States. Uh, I mean, the UNCRPD is the most influential human rights based document on disability. So, I mean, and it, I mean, uh, US has signed it, but it has not yet ratified it. So I think that's the one important thing where a very powerful country like, you know, America, which has a, you know, ADA, but in fact, still, uh, it has not got, a, I mean, in the Senate, I mean, it didn't get enough votes to ratify that particular convention. So I think that is the my wish list with the you know, present government that maybe they can ratify the UNCRPD so that we can talk about, you know, the global disability rights. Uh, in addition to that, I think uh, we need to talk about international collaborations. That is my wish list. Uh, and that's why where I can share one particular example that, you know, uh, Dr. Lisa makes who is from the University of Michigan. And she is the chair of the International Council for Inclusive Education. And because we have noticed that whether be it United States, be it United Kingdom, be it India, Australia or Canada, there are not, you know, uniform standards for uh, learners with disabilities in health professions, uh, health professional professions, and that's why what we need is an international framework where disability is viewed from a human rights perspective and reasonable accommodations. So we are working on that initiative, and we are, I mean, there are so many countries as well as you know medical councils which are part of this, and we shall be starting our international council. I think in the month of uh, March we are having our first meeting. And we would be preparing international standards for countries where there are not standards currently, or if there are countries where there are discriminatory guidelines, you know, they can be modified as per the international evidence. So that is the second thing, I think, international collaboration, because that is the need of the hour, because we need to bridge the gap, which is between global north and global south. In US, we have a good ADA, but in the global south still, there are many countries which are very poor and there are, you know, not uh, uh, many disability legislations existing. So we need to be talking about an international standards and international language. And the third thing is, I believe the most important thing is that we currently la- lack data. All of the policies which are being made for people with disabilities, they are made on data and the data is largely non-existent. Despite the, you know, 2015's world report on disability, we still lack data. So that is the first important thing until and unless we have data which is, uh, which can be shared globally. For example, if I give you one example, uh, the United Nations, they say is that, you know, the international countries, they need to have uh, the Washington set of questionnaires when they are doing the census. But unfortunately in our last census in India, we uh, did not use that particular Washington set of questionnaires. And that's why our, disability prevalence come, came out to be 2.2%. On the contrary, when uh, a, a group uh, of investigators from India and London, they did the prevalence using the Washington set of questionnaires, the prevalence uh, you know, comes uh, come out to be around 12%, a six times increase. And that is why we need I mean, uh, international data, which is comparable. And uh, that is the third important thing which we are talking about is that we need to have, you know, adequate data so that we can make policy. And the last thing I would say is that when we are making those policies, make sure that you are including people with disabilities in those decisions, because those decisions are made for our lives. And we need to be the most important stakeholders in those meetings and in those policy making decisions. 
Those are all great changes that hopefully will be made very, very well, very, very sooner in the, like I said, near future. Um, yeah. So you've been quoted um, saying um, that um, uh, that life itself is a full of cha- is full of challenges, and if you are leading a life without challenges, uh, then you are not living at all. Um, can you share with us how you uh, came to this inspiring conclusion? <laughs> I don't remember. I perhaps gave a bite in some interview where I said this. <clears throat> but, you know, life is not always uh, perfect. And, you know, just like uh, individuals with disabilities, we are not perfect. We have various differences. But that's the beauty of life, you know, being different and being... And, and what is a life if it is not challenging? Because I believe that, you know, my greatest asset has been the, my disability. And I'm proud of my disability because my disability has given me the power of perseverance and resilience, which I might not have got when, you know, uh, I don't have a disability. I think it has given me a lot and you already, everybody's life has various challenges, but you need to grab those opportunities. You need to tackle those challenges because what is a life if you're not tackling those challenges? Because I think the greatest joy is in, giving something and the greatest joy is in tackling those challenges because it gives meaning to your own life. And there is, there is, I mean, the biggest satisfaction is that when you know that based on your, uh, your small efforts, you are able to bring change to so many people out there. So many people from the marginal, marginalized section, so many people with disabilities. I think that's the biggest thing because ultimately when you are on this earth, you need to leave something behind. There has to be some legacy. And we all do something for our own personal life, but I think the biggest joy is in doing for something, someone, somebody else, changing their lives by your own small actions. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's really um, unfortunate. You know, sometimes people, um, you know, they, they can't see also like what, you know, what life really is and, you know, having a challenge, like we've spoken about, it's not an inability. Um, yes, you can have challenges, but you still have ability. And I mean, I just know from, you know, people's experiences that, you know, they don't, they don't look to the positive. They always look to the negative. Uh, that's also true with, uh, you know, uh, acquired disabilities, because uh, unlike congenital disabilities, which are present since birth, uh, anybody can acquire any disability anytime, right? You know, right now, um, anybody can have a road traffic accident and they can they can become, you know, a, a disabled person. Um, so in this way, we can say that we all of us are, you know, temporarily able-bodied. And this is the hard fact. This is a, this is a physiological phenomenon. Because when we are born, we cannot see, we cannot hear, we cannot walk. And the same thing happens towards the fragment of the life. Neither, you know, our eyesight diminishes our movement dim- diminishes, the, these things happen. And we need to live with that. So it is not something which only happened to certain people and it will not happen to you. I think that's the myth and we need to accept it that, you know, this is just a part of diversity. I, I, I agree. Um, so what do you think has been the most rewarding part of being an incredible force um, and change in India um, and really like across the world? Um, with your work and everything you do. You're like the president in my, in my mind <laughs> of disabilities and medical conditions. <laughs> so I think uh, it, it is a gradual learning. As I, as I said, you know, as I shared with you that when I was a medical student, you know, I was, uh, you know, brought up in the medical model of disability curriculum. And gradually I realized that, you know, there is a social model of disability. And now we are talking about human rights and fashion care. We are constantly evolving, and I think um, that way. I think the one positive uh, move was that in India we have around 540 medical schools, and uh, you know, right from the first year when we talk about disability rights in the new curriculum, that would change the mindset of future doctors. So I think that was my uh, one of the you know you can say small contribution which might affect uh, changes in the lives of the people. The second second thing I talked about the international council, which is there, and also I think one very important thing is that uh, we need to know that there are so many different disabilities, and very often what we see in the disability sector is that all of 
these uh, various disability groups, they are battling their own battles. There is not much collaboration, cross disability movement happening. I think that is a way forward that we need to talk about disability in a cross disability framework. And then we need to learn from other parallel movements which are happening, for example, other intersectionalities, right? What we can learn from, you know, Black Lives Matter, what we can learn from nobody is, is disposable. There are other marginalized sections like, you know, LGBTQIA plus community. They are also facing the same problem. Recently, you know, we filed this petition in India that, you know, intersex children, you know, uh, irreversible surgeries are being done on them. It is just like, you know, parallel to what is happening with people with disabilities when, you know, doctors make those calls. And the same things happen with uh, intersex, uh, you know, children where uh, there is a no life-threatening emergency. What is the need of performing those, those irreversible surgeries? That is why I think there is a lot of learning which is happening and we need to involve other sectors as well because we say in disability sector, nothing about us without us. And that is true for other marginalized community also. When we talk about people of color, when we talk about of other marginalized group, LGBT community, or those from you know poor uh, socioeconomic strata, we need to involve all of them because, uh, as I said, nothing about us without us. So I think these are the things, these are the important pinnings, I would say, which are important as a way forward to change the narrative. So it's going to be happening. It's amazing. And so lastly, uh, what uh, advice um, or uh, what, I guess, maybe words or messages would you um, like, uh, you know, everyone watching to take away from uh, this interview? Um, and, you know, you as a doctor and, you know, being who you are in India. Um, I think uh, I would say that we uh, people and society, this is my request to all the viewers and the audiences, that we need to look beyond our impairments. So when I say impairments, I also stress that disability is not inability. And you need to, uh, you know, view disability just like diversity, you know, we need to embrace diversity. I think we can do that uh, by when we change our ABCDE paradigm. Now, what is ABCDE? I would say attitude, behavior, communication, diversity, and empathy. So to embrace diversity, we need to, uh, you know, change our attitudes and behaviors towards people with disabilities. We need to make effective communication with people with disabilities. And when I say effective communication, it is both verbal and nonverbal. We need to respect diversity, including the intersectionality, because people with disability belong to other marginalized group as well. And we need to become empathetic to uh, embrace brokenness. I think that is the most important thing uh, because it is not only about uh, curing, as I'm a medical doctor, it is also about caring. And you can all only care when we are talking about compassionate care. So how one can talk about compassionate care? You can only understand that when you have that experience of vulnerability. And that vulnerability comes from our lived experiences of those of you know patients with disabilities and providers with disabilities so in the end i would say that you know embracing brokenness is embracing humanity with all its imperfections amen to that dr singh you you're wonderful <laughs> you're absolutely wonderful well this was wonderful